Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Daniel, one half of the Quack Brothers. Today, we're talking about how to invest in a recession. Welcome back, guys. This is Daniel, one half of the Quack Brothers, and I have my very, very good friend here, Mr. Randy Perler. How are you? Great. How are you? Very good. And uh, Randy has been an investor now for about 30 years, and you've seen a couple of recessions happen, haven't you? Yeah, I hate to date myself like that, but yeah, I've been through a few. Uh, in fact, when I bought my first house, I wouldn't say it was a recession, but the interest rates were so high, so it had its own challenges. I mean, yeah. interest rates for homes back then were 10 to 13%. Uh, so yeah, there's been times in, uh, in my life that I've seen that various challenges, including recessions, Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I, I brought him on here because he has seen those challenges and you've, you've, you know, obviously been through a couple market cycles now. Mm -hmm. And obviously I am one, I can't say that, you know, because mm -hmm. me being in my mid twenties, you know, this is the first recession that I'm going to participate in. And as you know, as I shared, you know, cause we're friends and we talk a lot off camera and, mm -hmm. you know, I stopped buying multifamily, uh, since 2017, I think that was the last the last apartment building I bought. And uh, I've been very weary because I've taken your advice along with many others who've gone through multiple uh, cycles. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, right? So for the for you guys that are watching at home, you know, maybe you're watching this on your phone, we're gonna talk about how to invest in real estate during a recession. Uh, before we get on to the topic and I start asking Randy some questions, guys, please feel, to, uh, feel free to subscribe to this channel. We're trying to hit 100,000 before this year ends and we're putting out a lot of great real estate content on how you guys can make money as real estate investors uh, during a recession. Uh, so again, Randy, thank you for being here. Question number one being, uh, in your experience, you know, 30 years of experience, uh, what should investors expect when it comes to a recession? Yeah, well, a recession it will hit the housing market, whether it's right away. Sometimes a recession, it, it impacts it. Sometimes it's insulated a little bit, but it, it will have uh, an impact. And what will that impact be? Well, you can look at housing prices. So the prices of homes, the values of homes, what people are willing to pay for the homes, that can be negatively impacted. Also, uh, foreclosures, the the uh, inventory out there of houses that the homeowners can't make payments on anymore. So just like the last one we had, um, increase in short sale opportunities and uh, foreclosure opportunities. And, and I'm using the word opportunities because savvy, well-trained, knowledgeable real estate investors will thrive during a recession. Um, they will thrive because they're doing strategies that other investors are not doing, don't know about, aren't comfortable with, they don't understand um, how to take advantage of those strategies during that time period. But if you look, think about it, every house that sells for you know half of its value at one time, somebody just picked the house up at half price uh, in comparison to what the prices will be just a few short years later. So you usually get a pretty good size rebound. But you have to evaluate all those things and the timing yeah. to, to buy a house, knowing that you could buy a house and it still may go down a little bit uh, if it's not bottomed out yet. But looking at those opportunities, again, helping people that need to short sale their house, that owe in short sale courses owing more than mm -hmm. what it's worth, uh, negotiating with those banks on their behalf in order to get that uh, that house out of their name and their payments off their back and coming in and doing it. And then the thing of it is, is you gotta think about your exit strategies, right? Because there's various with exit strategies. You may see a bump in people that want to do a lease with, with options to buy, mm -hmm. because if they've been foreclosed on, they're not gonna get a mortgage for a while, but they've already had a taste of home ownership and may wanna get back to that. And they don't wanna move their family from house to house to house. They had stability for 10 years and now they have to move out. The last thing they want to do now is put their kids through new school districts, yeah. new neighbors well, repeatedly. They, they don't want to make that change, especially during those times, you yeah. know, because those are costly, you know, not only costly financially, but also in terms of mentally and time. Uh, so I know you already mentioned a couple couple already, you know, you mentioned short sales, you mentioned lease options. Mm -hmm. um, so briefly, if you could explain uh, what is a short sale, because I'm sure a lot of individuals watching this video, you know, they're probably not at the level where you're at in mm -hmm. terms of investing. Uh, so what is a short sale and why is it advantageous? During, during recessionary times. Yeah, sure. So a short sale by definition is uh, a bank taking short of what's really owed. It's like getting a haircut, mm -hmm. okay? So if a bank, uh, if a homeowner, I'm sorry, if a homeowner owns, uh, uh, a homeowner owes 100,000 on a house and um, the current value, because of a decrease in the market, the current value of that house is only 90,000, 
there's a shortage there, right? They're what's called underwater, okay? Yeah. There's no equity or negative equity. They owe more than what it's worth. So the chance of them being able to sell, so let's say now they can't make their mortgage payment and they got to sell the property. Well, the market's not allowing them to sell at 100,000, right? Because the values are at 90,000. When they do comp, CMAs, the appraisal, that calls, all comes in at 90,000, but they don't have the difference. They don't have the spread mm -hmm. to cover that at a traditional close or a traditional sale. So a short sale was negotiating with a bank and, and they usually have to write a hardship letter it can't just be, oh, I want to sell, save yeah. you know, $10,000 on selling my house. Write in that hardship letter, getting it approved by the bank. And then the bank they say, can say yes or no. It's a third-party approval. So a, a buyer and seller can agree on that $90,000 price. Mm -hmm. But in a short sale, the lender also has to sign off on it. They have to agree to it. And basically, they're taking short. That's where the term short. They're taking short $10,000. So they may agree to go ahead, yes, you know, we're not getting, and why would they do that? Because you're not making payments now. It's costly to foreclose on somebody with time and the yeah. money and attorney and court costs. So the bank may accept short of what's owed to say, listen, let's get this thing sold. It'll be off of our books. Because again, if it's not on their books, it's non-performing asset. Yep. The bank's not allowed to borrow as much money for the feds to re- lend money at a profit. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And that, so obviously this is very, you know, advantageous to recessionary times because, well, you know, you and I have talked a lot, you know, during recessions, the default rate tends to go up. Mm -hmm. People tend to face the economic hardship. Uh, if it's an investment property, maybe they're not collecting as much rent as, as, they, as they thought. And also the values tend to go down as well. You yeah. know, and obviously the value is very important. The loan to value ratio is very important to the bank. Uh, you also mentioned lease option, right? So what is a lease option and why is it, you know, yeah. advantageous during recessionary times? Yeah. Well, first of all, lease option is a common term. And I really, uh, it's very important to separate those two out, especially in some states, because what you don't want to do as a buyer, someone offering a lease option, is you don't want the lease and the option tied together. So in other words, what I'm saying there is, let's say I put $10,000 down for the option mm -hmm. and then I'm leasing the property, right? So what happens if all of a sudden I'm not making the lease payments? Well, if the lease is tied to that money in certain states, certainly here in Illinois, you don't, you can't evict me. You have to foreclose on me mm -hmm. because I'm going to say I have an equitable interest in that house because that ten thousand dollars was tied to this lease. It's not just a lease anymore; it's an uh, installment contract, basically, yeah. right? So it can be done, but it needs to be done correctly. Um, so, but if you think about it, let's look at it from the other standpoint, though, as somebody that can't get. Uh, a mortgage now. I want to buy a house bad. I don't want that situation where I'm moving house to house to house with my family. I want that security of being at a place. So it's almost like a delayed version of owner financing, right? Yeah. Because I'm going to give an option payment, let's say $10,000 option, and then I'm going to also lease that property. But that option gives me the right to buy the property at a future date, at a future dollar amount, so that it gives me the comfort. It's almost like having the house. I know that when I'm ready to pull the trigger and I'm ready to get financing, I now can execute that and buy that house for a certain dollar amount. So it can be a win-win strategy. Both It's got to work for yeah, both parties. It does. But there are situations certainly coming if, we're, if people are starting to have trouble getting qualified for mortgages and we see a bit of a crunch there with the recession and they went through, let's say a bad, maybe they were unemployed for a year and their credit got dinged so much they can't not get, um, can't get approved, but let's say they got their job back or a similar job back. Right. So they have the income, but they don't have the credit. Well, let's, let's think about also how many people that we know, you know, whether that be our renters or, or even just people we have in our, in our network that have the cash but they don't have the credit, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the case for a lot of individuals. So, you know, we're, we're talking about how to make money, how to invest during a recession. We talked about short sales. We talked about lease option. And, and of course, we talked about subject to acquisition where we just recorded a video. So for those of you guys that are watching, if you guys want to learn more about subject to uh, check out the, the video that the Randy and I did on subject to it's in the whole video. Randy shares stories and I even offer some gifts mm -hmm. at the end there for people to, to, to go on their merry way and, and, and implement that strategy. So we've got three strategies strategies that people can use right now, in your opinion, as an investor who's invested for 30 years, um, what should be what should people be doing right now? 
because obviously the knife is still falling, metaphorically mm -hmm. speaking. Mm -hmm. We haven't really hit the valley mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. uh, what should people be doing? Well, I'm not an expert, and I don't claim to be an expert in this, but just I personally, I think you want to evaluate your portfolio right now. So if you do, if you're a current investor, uh, you want to look at your rental properties to make sure that they're in a position to carry you through a recession. If you uh, maybe your vacancy rate comes goes up, uh, is that a property you do want to hang on to? Is it now time to maybe lease option that property where you didn't before, so at least you have the lease leasing funds uh, available. So I would say evaluate your current portfolio. And then going forward, you know, ask yourself are the strategies that I'm uh, executing as a exit strategies that I'm planning, are those strategies going to weather uh, a, a recession? And what I mean by that is, if people aren't able to make uh, maybe their rent payments. Uh, people aren't able to buy, let's say, I, you know, I do a lot of flips, rehab and flips. Are people not getting qualified for the mortgages like they used to? Are your buyer pool of buyers going to going to, you know, squeeze down. And so maybe you've changed from flipping to maybe some long-term strategies. Mm -hmm. But also here's another thing, and it's kind of related to your question, is that a big source that I use for for uh, capital to do my deals are self-directed retirement accounts. So becoming an expert on self-directed self -directed retirement accounts, because there's prohibited transactions, there's prohibited parties, but to understand everything, how to do that legally, ethically, think about it, the stock market normally goes down in the recession, right? If you can offer those people an alternative to being in the market, like everybody else, right? Like just, we had a big, ding in the stock market, if you can offer them an alternative and with real estate, attached, whether that's attached to a rental property, to rehab projects, subject to acquisitions, short-term rentals, mm -hmm. you name it. If you have an alternative for them, that's going to look very attractive. Even if they don't put all of their retirement account into your deals, they can diversify very yeah. easily. And diversification is just not from this stock to this stock. Some people think that's diversification, but that's all the market, right? So if you can diversify, give them other options other than being stocks, yeah. bonds, mutual funds. So, so action steps for already existing landlords, uh, mm -hmm. you know, analyze your portfolio, mm -hmm. right? Figure out, and I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about a you know, capital reserve, mm -hmm. uh, figure out how much you have in reserves to, and do you have enough to carry you through? Um, what, what else should, should they be looking at? Should they be looking at their equity positions? Should they be looking at uh, their tenant basis? You know, real quick, what, what should they be looking at for existing landlords? Yeah, I think they have to evaluate their tenants. I, that was a really good point you just kind of brought up in that question is because, um, most leases are your lease, right? And then I don't know about you, but a lot of my leases, then I just go on a month to month after that with my particular tenants. Usually if you're renting in kind of the lower rent markets, I think, I always think a uh, month to month is a good way to do it because a, a year lease and someone that loses their job, it really ties you as a landlord. Yep. It doesn't tie them because if they can't make payments, they're not going to make payments. Right, because you got to so evict like, them instead exactly. of as opposed to, yeah. right. On a month to month, you can at least, it doesn't have to be for, for non-payment of rent. But I would look at your renters and evaluate them in terms of what's the best going forward. Because in some cases, it may be talking to those renters, ask about their intentions to move forward, their ability to take, uh, you know, make rent for, pay rent for the next year or so. And if they can foresee some issues with their job, maybe they got a new job, but it's not paying as much, it actually might be advantageous to reduce the rent $50 a month yeah. uh, to keep that renter in there. Cause you know, every time there's turnover, that's a lot, that's a big expense. Yeah, getting it's it a prepped. lot. But that's what I would do as well is have those conversations as their leases start to become uh, terminated or ending and see what your best strategy is. Let them go on a month to month, mm -hmm. sign another lease, negotiate, re reduce the rents, uh, put them on a subject or a um, option to buy. Maybe they've got the money. Maybe yeah. those are somebody that you're thinking, I don't know if this property should really be an option to buy. I just want to keep it as a rental. Well, you may evaluate it and say, you know what, if they got the money now, I'll get the 10,000, 20,000, whatever option money. And then I can weather this storm you know, exactly. that comes up. So, so, so capital know. reserves, uh, analyzing your tenants, right? Basis. And also, uh, self-directed IRAs, mm -hmm. you know, possibly tapping into that capital source. Uh, what would you say to somebody who, you know, they haven't done their first deal yet and they're watching this video to kind of check it out uh, and they're wanting to take advantage of a recession because they know, they know that it, it can be an opportunistic yeah. time, you know, especially for guys like yeah. us, you know, yeah. um, they know it can be an opportunistic time. They want to get started. They see it and they, they choose to be optimistic about it. What advice would you give them? 
Well, one thing I would say, you know, get trained on various strategies, okay? Understand various strategies, okay? Because I, I think that really is their armor during this time that they can offer different things, move in different directions. And the other thing is do, even if they haven't done their first deal, do research on deals. Uh, I saw one of your videos, your brother Sam was talking about um, watching a uh, Shark Tank episode <laughs> and talking about how the guy pitched yeah. basically on and Shark Tank. And he had Tank, no sales. And he had no sales, yeah. no company, base, or you know, no product sales, no product yet. But then taking it and implementing that to real estate, I thought that was very smart of him to be able to make that parallel. Well, think about it. That new person, you can do the same thing. I know people have been very successful flippers, and to get that first deal, all that they did is analyze, go, go research, to see what properties were foreclosed on, what they were sold, or what what they sold at the foreclosure auction was, then approximately how much money was put in, and they could look at pictures after pictures, right, and see what it sold for. So having that data, having that knowledge, and then taking it to someone that's looking to diversify their four hundred one k or IRA, uh, looking uh, going to those people and saying, look at, I haven't done this deal myself, but look at the money others are making. Yeah. We could do this together, you know, and have that buy-in. And, and that only comes from you doing your homework, mm -hmm. you know, you understanding the strategies, you understanding the market, you, you having the data to support what you're proposing to somebody if they're gonna partner in with you. So that could be huge because the, the foreclosure, I mean, if you just look at the foreclosure markets, the auctions, I bought a lot of properties at in-person auctions, online auctions, foreclosed properties, probably half my rental for portfolio, maybe more, were foreclosures. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not negotiating with a homeowner that has a emotional attachment to the yeah. house. It's all about the numbers. You can make low offers, you can, you know, and you're not offending them because their baby was born in that house, you know, right? So it, you know, foreclosures offers, a, you know, another great opportunity, yeah. but you need money for the foreclosures. You're not gonna get a conventional, you know, uh, financing on that. So building uh, your network of investors, partners, that understand self-directed IRAs right. and 401 Which also leads me to say that they should press like on this video because they could learn more about real estate and you know get get more of our videos on our recommended. Yeah. And you also have a YouTube channel as well. So before yes, we kind of close off this video, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of uh, you know promote your YouTube channel because you have a lot of valuable content on there. How can people look for you? Yeah. So if you just go to YouTube and you search for Randy Pertler, that's Randy and then Pertler, P-E-R-T-L-E-R. Uh, you can find my YouTube channel, and I have a lot of videos, maybe not as much as you guys do, you get the king of videos. Uh, I have a lot of videos that are property tours, for an example. I do a lot of stuff on property tours. So when I'm flipping a property, I'll go through the house maybe when I first buy it, and then the, you'll, so you'll see one video, and then maybe halfway through, and you'll see the rough-in plumbing and electrical, and then you'll see the finished product. Uh, so you'll have those type of videos, also some training videos. Mm -hmm. Some of them are a little lengthy, but they're good content if you can get through them. And, uh, yeah, I'd love you to join my YouTube channel, and uh, I think we're kindled spirits here. Yep. We we uh, are both you know firm believers in yep. doing things right and uh, doing it the right way. And I admire what you guys have been doing. And yeah, well, been, thanks, uh, man. Yeah, it's been a great blessing 100%. to many people. Thank yeah. you. Likewise, and and for those of you guys that want to hear more about Randy's story and get more of a detailed uh, on on how you started and and the details of how you scaled, we recently recorded a podcast together on my podcast called The First Deal Experience. So check it out on Spotify, iTunes, different an outlet where you get your podcast. Thank you guys so much for watching. Randy, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So check out his YouTube channel and subscribe to our channel as well. I'll see you guys in the next one.